Savior, brother, and friend. Lord, we're so thankful that you have granted us another day with your precious breath of life. Lord, what are we without thee? We are hopeless and we are helpless. Everything we are, every fiber of our being, we have to give gratitude to you. We're so thankful. We're so selfish, Lord. We need help. We need a transformation. We need a reformation. Lord, you granted us here in this place five days. There's so much to talk about and so much to discuss. What can we do in five days? So my prayer, Lord, is that you would please bless us with information that needs to be brought forth, that you would send showers of blessing from heaven. I am not authorized or qualified to stand here before your people. It is a fearful thing you tell us in your word Amen. to fall into the hands of a living God, of the living God. So, Lord, I pray that you would please be with me, be with us, speak through me. Help us, Lord, to have a better understanding of your will, of your plan for the end of, end of the age. In Jesus' name we love, ask, and thank you. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Amen. I want to thank officially Sister and Brother Sanderson for inviting us out for this week. Amen. Amen. I've, I've over the years flown through Phoenix many times. This is my first time leaving the airport as of yesterday. And many layovers at that airport. But praise God for the opportunity to be able to speak and share and teach and wonder at what's going on on this earth. Can you believe what's going on here? I think about it, I say, Lord, we are really at the very end. We're here. So my brothers and my sisters, I'm praying that these next five days, you and myself, only through the unction of the Holy Spirit, have a better understanding and appreciation for what God has blessed us with, with the three angels' messages. Can you all say that with me? The three, three angels, angels of messages. Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Do we truly understand what we have? We've been given information ahead of time so we can know what to do. Amen. I think we take it for granted as a people many times. Our only hope, and the middle name of this church, I understand, is hope, right? The community yes. of hope. Right. Group, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen? Amen. Amen. But our only hope is where? It's right here. In this book. 66 books. 3,116,480 letters. 1,189 chapters. 31,102 verses. 783,137 words in this King James Version of the Bible. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. well, my Bible tells me and your Bible tells you in Matthew 4, verse 4, for it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of, food of God. So we can't, we can't compromise. We have to take the third angel's message, which is a warning message to the world, but also to us, to prepare us. So we're not talking about... I'm going to dress this way, but I'm going to still eat that. Well, I'm going to live over here in Phoenix until the Sunday law passes. We're going to talk about these things this week. Do you know that 95% at least 
uh, Seventh Day Adventists in the United States of America live in the cities. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. 95%. That tells me that we're going to be real this week. We have to be real so we can know what to do. Come on. I can tell you right now, if the majority of you are living in Phoenix, in Tempe, in Scottsdale, you're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck. We've reached a point, based on how the world is going, based on how worldlings are moving out of the cities in droves, buying up everything all over the place, all over this country, in rural areas. Companies are encouraging them now. Corporations, we want you to move to the country because when you're happy, we're happy because the company's bottom line is happy. So go take your family and go out to the country. So, of course, that means that there's less opportunity for God's remedy. Let me ask you a question. Do you trust God? Yeah. Did God make provision for this time in Earth's history? Yes. Does he have a plan? Yes. Does he have a good plan? Yes. Any God, amen, sister. Any plan God comes up with or draws up is good, amen? Amen. So he has made provision, allotment for everything taking place right now. And there are so many examples in the Word of God that we're going to go through this week that testify to the fact that even though you are in the city, there's a figure in the Bible who was in a city who God blessed because there's a condition he wants you out, but there's a condition. If you are stuck, we're going to talk about all that this week. Amen. It comes to a point where we have to say, Lord, I will do all for you and sacrifice all. And I mean all. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. So five days. What's the name of that title? Preparation for the approaching storm. This is a five-day analysis on the implementation of God's, what's that middle word? Perfect. Perfect. What's that last word? Solution. Solution. God has a solution for every problem. And I mean every problem. What happened today? Let's talk today. They stormed the Capitol. I got a chance to watch maybe an hour of it or so. My phone was blowing up all day. This is unprecedented, brothers and sisters. Do we really understand what's happening here? We're going to talk about previews tonight. This is a preview of something that's coming later, a preview. I'm not going to quite say a type, but it's a preview. If they were allowed to bust down the walls or the fences and storm the White House or the Capitol, go inside, tear up the place, nobody arrested, nobody shot, that tells me a lot. We're talking about a revolution. Mm -hmm. The revolution is here, and it is being televised. Mm -hmm. I know Gil Scott Heron said something different years ago. <laughs> it is being televised. Are you with me? This is the place where they have their address of the nation, or address to the country, held every so often, the president. They were in there, the people who stormed, they called them a mob. The mob was in there, the people thought they heard a gunshot, and they're clamoring, they're hiding down here for cover. Now, I saw many, many videos, many, many images, many, many clips of this, that, and the other from all over that, that area there. Out of all the people I saw, out of every person that was shown on that camera what they were doing during this crisis, and this was a crisis, this sister right here was the only she was one praying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she went that I saw. What did she do? She was praying. She was praying. And she was praying earnestly and she was praying fervently. And I mean, she was praying. What does that tell you? It tells you that when Americans are in trouble, they don't look to God, they look to the leaders. That picture says a whole lot right here. Nobody but her, at least on camera, was shown praying today. So brother, sister, we're talking about a serious revolution that's taking place in our world today. So five days, Great Controversy 592, the dignitaries of church and what? State will unite to do what? Bribe, persuade, or compel, how many classes? All classes. All classes to honor the sun day, the sun day. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments or laws. Legislation. 
Is that a nice word? No. Political corruption, are we seeing that? Have we seen that the last 40 years? Yes, we have. Is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, some say free, rulers and legislators, leaders and those that pass and make laws and establish laws in order to secure what? Public favor. They'll do what? Yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Popular. So the majority of people in our nation are going to be so fed up or so fearful, we're going to see in a few minutes, that they're going to do the same thing that took place today. I'm going to tell you something. What they got away with today is going to more embolden them to do something else next time. But remember, who, we're not talking about them. Who's behind them? Satan face. Satan has a goal, he has an end game. We're going to see that in a second. So he's weaving his way through this process to get to a point. Now, another different angle. 615, same book. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined, the other uh, reference said united, to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority. Who's that? Well, that's you and not. If, if we're faithful. That's why Revelation 12, 17 calls us a remnant. The whole ship is not sinking or going through. It's not. That's a fact. So what is it going to take to be part of that remnant? We're going to see that this week. A small minority to yield to the public or popular demand will make them, excuse me, objects of universal execration, hatred, hatred. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to one, an institution of the church, and to a law of the state ought not to be tolerated. That it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. Is that how bad things are going to be? Where whole nations are going to be out of control? It's happening right now. Today. So she's basically quoting Caiaphas in John 11, verse 50. Better that one man perish, or one man die, than the whole nation perish. Mm -hmm. Caiaphas said that. It's going to be the same thing then. The same exact thing. Mm -hmm. So what is that? My wife and I, a little over a year ago, went on a nice mission trip to Africa. It was a life-changing experience. We were in Ethiopia, uh, sorry, Kenya for two weeks doing a, a series of meetings there. My wife flew home immediately after that. I flew straight to Ethiopia for a month. This was my toilet for a month. This is called a compost toilet. It's a hole in the earth. And I went, and I'll say this respectfully, number one and number two for a month in that. It was humbling. The whole experience was humbling, but I praise God for it. I had to wash clothes in a basin. No running hot water. No shower, no indoor plumbing. Everything was walking. Everywhere we went, we walked. Back and forth to the church to do the meetings at night, every night. Bible studies during the day. Amen. We did a lot of walking. This humbled me. Now this was the Mercedes-Benz Rolls Royce version of this. <laughs> where we were staying. The conference of the Eastern, Eastern Ethiopia uh, Union rented a person's home which had this in the back. Wow. So they actually put concrete around it for us they treated us like dignitaries, actually. This was the same situation at the church. This was the church's version at that church, the Aduna District Seventh-day Adventist Church. We had an experience. This is my lesson. Don't laugh too much at that, because at some point, we're going to all That's be faced right. with this. That's right. Listen, listen. Are you serious about going through with this train? I mean, serious. If you are planning to be in the mountains at some point, you're going to bring your toilet out there with you? We're talking about survival skills. Yes, God's going to feed us. Yes, he's going to make sure our water is sure and our bread, but there are other things, other elements and components involved with that. How about cold? How about heat? How about water? How about food? This is reality. This is our future. Yes. If we're faithful, are you ready to get on this train and go all the way through? Is the question. 
are we so comfortable with our conveniences here in America? And when we were there, I saw Revelation 13 jump right off the page. And I saw clearly why the USA is going to be the first to pass a National Sunday Law. Too much convenience, too much prosperity, full of bread. The furthest to fall. It has to start here. You had major cities we were at in Nairobi, over 3 million people, 4 million people. Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, 3, 4 million people. But they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have what we have here. Believe me. So America is going to collapse and give in much sooner than everybody else. But God is a gracious God. What do you say? Amen. 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 So preparation for the approaching storm. So this week, we're going to do a lot of studying, a lot of reading. We're going to do a lot of praying. It's praying necessary. Yes. We're at the end of time, so we have to get, as I'm going to say this all week and beat it in your head, we got to get much more serious and much more committed to going to heaven. It's going to be serious trials and serious troubles upcoming. You can see it all unfolding right now. I called a family member today as soon as I saw what was happening in D.C. A family member who's in the world who's a Catholic. And they still don't believe it. Every time something happens to show that prophecy is clearly unfolding and revealing, I call somebody or call this particular person, and they still don't believe it. COVID's going to go away. Everything's going to be back to normal in the coming months. That's not going to happen. And I'm using that as ammunition to get people to understand that time, 11, 12 months ago, is ancient history. It will never come back to that. And it's going to continue to deteriorate and slide out of control. When you see these things come to pass, just like John, uh, Jesus said in John 14, verse 29, Behold, I show you before it come to pass, so when it is come to pass, ye might what? Believe. Mm -hmm. So I'm continuing to drive this home to these people. It's going to keep getting worse and worse. One day you'll wake up and see, this is not America or the world we once knew. It's over. It's over. So what I'd like to do now, all of you who are able, let's take a moment. Let's get on our knees. If you're able, let's talk to God and beg him, Lord, make us ready. Help us to understand what's going on this week. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity and privilege of studying your word, precious words of life. You've given us your word, your Bible. You've given us the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. Please, dear Lord, please. Grant us, grant us holy angels, which you call ministering spirits in Hebrews 1.14. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Help us to have a better appreciation for what you've given us, glimpses of the future so we can be prepared, and more importantly, get our families prepared, our children, grandchildren, those of us who have them, neighbors, friends, our entire sphere of influence. Please, dear Lord, please work with us this week. Work with us. Touch our hearts. Help us, Lord, to look like your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, ask, and thank you. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask you all to please turn your Bibles to our theme verse for this week. Our theme is found in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to ask somebody to do me a favor. Right at 8.30, can somebody kind of just raise their hand and notify me right at 8.30 so I can get an idea where I am time-wise? 1 John chapter 2. Church, are you ready to study? Yes. 1 yes. John chapter 2. And our theme this week is going to be found in verse 6. 1 John 2 and verse 6. When you all get there, please respond by saying... Amen. 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 First John 2 and 6, Lord, we praise me. Open your words. They are precious. They are love and they are life. Please bless them. Give us understanding and insight. We ask and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 6 of 1 John 2. He that saith he abideth in him, meaning who? Jesus, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. What is this verse saying? It's telling us very simply, whatever Jesus did on earth, we need to be doing on earth. However he walked, we need to walk the same way. First Peter chapter 2 tells us that he is our example, right? He left us an example that we should follow his steps. 
The Bible says he was without guile, right in his mouth, no guile. He was without sin, but he was threatened. He what? He, 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 when he was threatened, if you get this right, help me, Holy Spirit. When he was threatened, he didn't respond. He was reviled. He reviled not again, right? So how many of us are in that position right now? Somebody steps on, steps on our toe or cuts us off on the freeway. Well. Mercy. We have to overcome that. Yeah. We have to get to a point where we don't respond. Jesus is our example. He didn't respond, so we cannot respond. Are we there yet? We have to get there. Are you with me? We have to get there. So again, five days. We need two weeks. Five days. God is able. There's a storm brewing here. What are these men doing? It looks like they're doing some type of agriculture, aren't they? Yes. They're harvesting, aren't they? All right. There's a storm brewing here also. What are they doing? Are they preparing? He's taking pictures. Maybe he's taking selfies. I don't know what he's doing, but her hair is blowing in the wind. Something's coming. A storm is approaching. But you have two different reactions to the storm, don't you? One group is preparing for the storm. The other group thinks they're okay. They're not concerned, and they probably won't be concerned until the storm actually hits them. Until, in other words, put prophetically speaking, until the crisis arrives. In the military, they say the best time to prepare for war is during a time of what? Peace. Peace. You can take that to the bank. So we need to be doing that when? Now, we should have been doing it a long time ago. Yes. But God, God is merciful and he's gracious and he's faithful. Yes. So we have to get things going when? Now, now, like today. It is in a crisis that what is revealed? Character. Character. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah. The real you comes out when things aren't going so lovely. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it time and time again in my little half century on this earth. Believe me. So are we there yet? Hmm. This is Mr. Trump. This is Ms. Burks. This is Mr. Fauci. The question is, are we where yet? Now, Fauci responds in a few more months, maybe. They don't realize, or maybe they do realize, that the goal here is not necessarily their goal. It's Satan's goal. Satan has a goal. He's trying to get to a certain point. But he can't do it all overnight. He wants to rule the world. He wants 10 global kingdoms, and he wants this earth to be his earth. The Bible says that. The Bible calls him the prince of this world, and also the Bible calls him the God of this world. Prince of this world in John 14, 30, God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Please take notes if you're writing. So, who's this? Mr. Gates. Looks like a nice man. <laughs> well, we don't know what's going on here, do we? This has happened, apparently. The pandemic. Fear is everywhere. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Everywhere. Information control and censorship. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Shut down and social distancing. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Blame President Trump? Yes. yes. Now, these should be switched. I think this one needs to be here. Martial law and checkpoints need to be last because the vaccine is being rolled out and people are taking it. Some are taking it, some are not. We're going to get into that. So martial law and checkpoints, I believe, will come very shortly. This is going to be a serious year. You think 2020 was something? Prophetically speaking, according to the word of God, 2021 has to be worse. Is it, does it not? Yes. Absolutely. Where is she? In a maze. A maze. A human maze. That's right. This is Satan's maze. We call it the Satan's maze of what? Fear. First we had COVID-19. That created what? Fear. Then the lockdown. The media overload. That's all you hear about and all you talk, people are talking about is what? COVID-19. The corona. Except for today. Except for today. That's another story. Revolution. Now there was another revolution taking place with all the civil unrest. Now we're seeing a new kind of revolution kind of come up to the forefront. You see that today? Conspiracies all over the place. Fear. Death. Lots of people dying. 
calamities, rumors, fear, new strain, hmm. forced mandatory vaccinations, brother, sister, all of this, Satan is weaving his way through, and what he wants to get to is this right here. This is his goal, National Sunday Law, because he wants to destroy the river. But he can't, again, do it overnight. Michelle Obama says she's dealing with low-grade depression during the lockdown. Hmm. Is that happening in our world today? Mm -hmm. Michelle Obama said on her podcast that she's been having trouble sleeping and has been feeling depressed. Spiritually, these are not fulfilling times, she said. These are very fulfilling times for me, brothers and sisters. I don't know about you. The most fulfilling in my whole life. Michelle Obama said that she's dealing with some form of low-grade depression due to the coronavirus lockdown, racial strife in the U.S., and the Trump administration. Hmm. This is happening all over the country, brothers and sisters, and all over the world. People are very, very worried. Are Adventists worried? Very many Adventists are worried. We're going to get to that. There are things you can do to manage stress during these difficult times. Among the CDC's recommendations, get accurate information about what to do if you're sick with COVID-19, take a break from the news, get exercise, try to eat healthy, try to get enough sleep, avoid excessive alcohol. That's four out of the eight laws of health right there. We'll, we'll get to that. Connect with others and talk with people. Make time to do activities you enjoy. Learn where to get treatment. I don't say anything in here about praying and asking God what's going on. They're not concerned about God. They're not thinking about God. Stealing to survive. These are some of the consequences or the results of the COVID-19 pandemic. Stealing to survive. More Americans are shoplifting food as aid runs out during the pandemic. A lot of things taking place that you might not be seeing in all the headlines. But this is serious. This affects the bottom line of all these stores. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right. USA Today exclusive, two-thirds of Americans say they won't get COVID-19 vaccine when it's first available. USA Today Suffolk poll shows. I wonder how many of us in this room today, if the vaccine were available here, would take it. I'm not going to ask the question. I'm not going to ask you to identify yourselves. We have to talk, church, this week. we got to talk. God has a plan. He's made provision. June 6th, 1863, he shows Sister White a beautiful vision on disease and its causes. He told dear Ellen White, he said, as the bird by wallowing and the swallow by flying, so the curse caused less shall not come. Proverbs 26, 2. That's what he showed her. It's not about just getting sick and covering it up and eliminating the symptoms. We have to get to the root cause of what made you sick. Symptoms are your friend. God, what's that word? Never. Does that mean that he does it maybe once or twice a month or every six months? Never. Never forces the will or the conscience. But Satan's constant, is that every other month or maybe twice a year? No. Always, always resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce. It's compulsion by what? Cruelty. That's all he knows. Listen, through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. Worship, worship. To accomplish this, what? Secure worship to himself. He works through both religious and secular authorities. He's done it all the way through the Bible. Moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. This is Satan's method of operation. Fear. And he's succeeding. Spain to keep register of those who refuse COVID vaccine. Uh-oh. You mean I want to be on record? If I decide I don't want to take it, there's going to be something logged in somewhere with my name saying he refused to take the vaccine. You think that's coming here? Yeah. Spain is set up to uh, register, is to set up a register, excuse me, of people who refuse to be vaccinated against coronavirus and share it with other 
shared with other European Union nations, the health minister has said. Huh. Why do the other nations in Europe have to know my business? Is it, is it me being a, a Spain resident? Is it that enough? Doesn't Spain? No. All of Europe has to know, and at some point, all the world is going to have to know. Satan's not playing. Look, he said the way to defeat the virus was to vaccinate all of us. The more, the better. Did you get that? Spain has been one of the countries in Europe worst affected by the virus. Mm. In other comments on Monday, Mr. Ia said people would be contacted by regional authorities when it was their turn. Regional authorities? You mean a clinic or a hospital can't just call me up and say, Mr. Bridges, you need to come down and take your shot. Regional authorities. That sounds serious. People who decide not to get vaccinated, which we think is a mistake, are within their rights. We are going to try to solve doubts. Hmm. Getting vaccinated saves lives. It is the way out of this pandemic. Regional leaders can modify curfew times and can also close regional borders for travel. So apparently they have some serious authority. But they're the ones that are going to call these people to say, we need you to come take the shot. If you want to travel next year, you may need a vaccine passport. You know what's coming, right? Yes. Any flights you take, mm -hmm. driving cross country, trying to get from one state to the other, you're gonna need a you're gonna need a state to state passport. It's all coming. It's already set up. It's only a matter of time before they they put it into motion, right? Before they engage it. Human disaster unfolding in LA will get worse. Experts say. Watch this. LA ambulances not to transport patients with little chance of survival. In other words, if you've had a heart attack, if your artery is 99.87% clogged, if you had an aneurysm or something that's near fatal, don't take them to the hospital. They're too crowded. Just let them die. That's what he's saying. This was yesterday, January 5th, 2021. It's a human, too many people in the hospitals. They're overrun. They're setting up triages and all kinds of things in parking lots, at parks, at gymnasiums, everywhere they can to fit people. And remember now, we're just at the beginning. This is entry level compared to what's coming. Don't kid yourselves. Listen, stress in America 2020 survey signals a growing national mental health crisis. Hmm. Along with stress, stress from COVID-19 related to healthcare, the economy, Racism and the presidential election is seriously threatening the mental health of our country, particularly our youngest generation, according to a new national survey. This is the same thing that was stressing out Mr. Obama. Yeah. Same thing. It's a broken record. And again, I was raised in the 70s, so I say broken record. Some of you might say broken MP4, amen? <laughs> now, this is, the, this is the conclusion. The report includes insights on specific ways policymakers, civic leaders, educators, and parents can support those who are most affected. Such strategies include facilitating access to mental health services, etc., creating new and safe opportunities, etc., help young people observe important milestones, etc., provide innovative educational work, training, and employment, etc., acknowledge the sacrifices that have been made by Generation Z. This generation has been forced to give up social involvement that is critical to their development. Milestones such as graduations and proms. Is that in God's plan? No. And even... Is that God's education? No. Acknowledging this sacrifice could encourage Gen Z to continue the difficult job of refraining from normal social activity and elevate their actions as a, what's that word? Solution to overcoming the pandemic's global impact. What's that word? Solution. This is the world's solution. Are you with me? We're going somewhere. UN Moore's 2021 saving up to be a humanitarian what? Catastrophe. Next year is shaping up to be a humanitarian catastrophe and rich countries must not trample poor countries in a stampede for vaccines to combat the coronavirus pandemic. That's good. 
2021 is literally going to be catastrophic based on what we're seeing to, at this stage of the game. He said 2021 was likely to be the worst humanitarian crisis year since the beginning of the United Nations 75 years ago. Did you get that? We simply cannot accept a world in which the poor are marginalized and trampled by the rich and powerful in the stampede for vaccines. Tedros told the General Assembly, this is a global crisis and the, what's that word? Solutions must be shared equitably as global public goods. There's that word again. But it's not God's solution. It's not God's solution. God has a plan. Right. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. The Great Reset. Let me tell you something. It's not just economic brothers and sisters. They want to reset our minds. I've read that all over the internet. They want to reset our minds. They're using the pandemic as an excuse to restart everything that civilization has been doing for the past at least, at least 100 years. I'm talking about a total reset. How do you do that? You gotta change something deep inside to do that. We're talking about DNA. But that's another study. Watch. Mm. There, this is a little small, I'll read it to you. There is an urgent need for global stakeholders. Global stakeholders? You mean there's a group of people that have a stake monetarily in this whole world and how it operates and making those major decisions on a global level? Global, don't, don't pass over this language, this verbiage here. To cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19. Again, this is the excuse, the justification for doing it. SD1 or SDI 2020, let's keep going. The COVID-19, I'm gonna blow that up, that's too small. The COVID-19 crisis and the political, economic, and social disruptions it has caused is fundamentally changing the traditional context for decision-making. It is. The inconsistencies, inadequacies, and contradictions of multiple systems from health and financial to energy and education are more exposed than ever amidst the global context of concern for lives, livelihoods, and the what? It all comes back to planet Earth, doesn't it? It all comes back to the green thing. But look at this. this is their, these, these are their four points as far as their major concerns. Health, financial, energy, education. Does God have a health plan? Yes. Does God have an economy for his people? Yes. Does God have a plan where we can live somewhere and not be on, this, on the system or the grid? Yes. Does God have an education plan? Yes. God has everything, brothers and sisters, you and I need. Amen. Amen. Everything has been provided for him. Every provision is already in place. We've got to read the Bible. We've got to read the little books. We'll get all of it, and we're going to do that by God's grace this week. Amen? Amen. God has a plan. And it's, it's like I said earlier, it's a good plan. We like God's plan. How about you? Yes. Yes. World economic, let me blow that up. World economic forum partners are world-class companies with a strong interest in developing systemic, what's that word? There it is again. Systemic solutions to key challenges. Hmm. The world solution. Who are they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. Every how many? Every institution established by Seventh Day Adventist. Seventh who? So don't, don't be bashful. Seventh who? Seventh Day Adventist is to be to the world one what Joseph was in Egypt, and two what Daniel and his fellows were where in Babylon. They solved problems. In other words, in other words, put another way, they had solutions mm -hmm. to the world's problems. So the same way God used Joseph in Egypt, the same way he used Daniel in Babylon, he wants to use you and I today in the midst of this crisis because this world is full of problems. God has the answers. What do you say? Amen. 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 
Preachers should have no scruples to preach the truth as it is found in God's word. Do you agree? Yes. Let the truth do what? Yes. I had a talk with Sister Sanderson a couple of days ago. We were still in Tennessee. And she said, we, we want the truth. We want you to cut up. We, we want to bleed out. <laughs> I said, praise the Lord. Amen. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is they are one afraid of hurting feelings. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step on some toes this week. I hope you wear your, your, your steel uh, boots, steel toe boots. Amen. Fearful of not being courteous. And they three, lower the standard of truth. And four, conceal if possible the peculiarity of our faith. Isn't that a shame? This beautiful, beautiful third angel's message. How can we hide that? Listen, I saw that God could not make such successful. Are we talking about successful, meaning how much money is in the ministry bank account? No, we're talking about winning souls. Amen. Winning souls to God's kingdom. Amen? Amen? Watch. The truth must be made what? Pointed. And the necessity of the decision urged. Big decisions need to be made this week. Big decisions. Giving everything, if this was an altar. Putting everything on this altar. Lord, I want to live the third angel's message you gave us this message to prepare us, Lord, and I want to, I want to obey and live every component, every element, every nook and cranny of the third angel's message. But I can't do it without your help. Help me, Lord, to fulfill your will. Live this message so I can be saved. What do you say? Amen. Look, and as false shepherds are crying peace and are preaching smooth things, the servants of God must cry aloud and spare not and leave the result with who? God. Tell it like it is. She's quoting Isaiah 58, verse 1. Tell the truth. Do you want the truth? Yes. I pray so. The experience of Enoch and John the Baptist represents what ours should be. So what's she saying? Something about their lives we need to study. In fact, she says this in the next sentence. Far more than we do, Community of Hope Church, we need to study the lives of these men. Enoch and John the Baptist, he who was translated to heaven without seeing death, which one was that? Amen. Amen. Study in church, amen. And he who before Christ's first advent was called to do what? Prepare the way of the Lord to make his paths what? Straight, straight. So does that mean he got a shovel and a pickaxe no. and started shoveling and, and, no. and putting clear and shrubbery and putting this road together to get people to go to Jesus? No. Not prepare the way like that. Prepare right in here. Mm -hmm. This is what he's talking about. Preparing the heart way. What do you say? Yes. As a prophet, John Baptist was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and for disobedience to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Watch this. Please get this lesson, brothers and sisters. She says, in preparing the way for, let me go back. For Christ's first advent, he was a what? Representative or a sign or a model or a figure or a type. A representative of those who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. So John Baptist prepared the way for the first coming. We are preparing the way for what? The second coming. We. He represents you and me. So there's something in John's life that we need to look at this week. What did he do that was so special that set him apart? That she says, we have to do the same thing that John Baptist did. He represents us. He's the second Elijah. The first Elijah is the first Elijah. John Baptist is the second Elijah, and the 144,000 are going to be the third Elijah's to finish this work. Amen? Amen. Our message, the third angel's message, must be as direct as was the message of who? John. Was he direct? Yes. Listen. He rebuked what? Kings. He rebuked kings for their iniquity. Notwithstanding that his life was in peril, are you ready for that? You, you, you say you want to be as direct as John the Baptist. His life was constantly in peril. 
but he did not hesitate to declare God's word. And our work in this age, today, with Corona and everything that's going on, must be done as faithfully. Amen. You got to tell the people the truth. Amen. If you're shy, pass out literature. One testimony, Sister White calls the literature evangelism. She calls the books in the tracks the voiceless preachers. Amen. The voiceless preachers. So you're handing somebody a sermon. And they're going to read it. You don't try to beat them over the head. You've got to read this. No, give the Holy Spirit a chance to do his work. He's going to impress that person when it's time to read that book. We know a family, we gave them a track. And one time they let us sit in the drawer for a year, a whole year. And they felt, they felt impressed all of a sudden to go in the drawer, it was a kitchen drawer, pulled it out, started reading it. They were converted. God will do it. The angels are going to come to these people, brothers and sisters, when the time is right. And going to have them pull out these books, this literature, and it's going to have them turn to the page they need to turn to. Amen. To match up what's happening in that track of book with what's happening in society and the world. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Are angels able to do that? Amen. In this fearful time, like right now, just before Christ is to come the second time, God's faithful preachers will have to bear a still more pointed testimony that was born by John the Baptist. A responsible, important work is before them. And those who speak smooth things, God will not acknowledge as his shepherds. Well, a fearful woe is upon them. I have to tell it like it is. Amen. Amen. What happened to John the Baptist? You, you, you say you're ready. You, you say you want to speak out, spare loud, spare not, cry loud, spare not. You want to tell it like it is? You, you don't want to bite your tongue? You, you say that. What are you going to do when somebody comes to your child with a gun or a machete? What are you going to do? This is serious business, Sam. Serious business. The only way, the only way we're going to get through it is to hold on as tight as we can to Jesus. I'm talking about bending down, wrapping the hem of his garment, and, and holding on as tight as you can, and not letting go. We got to eat, drink, and sleep with this. This is it. This is our ticket right here. My wife and I have committed, and we're, we're not a template by any means. We committed. We say, okay, we see where we are. We need to be connected all the time. Bed at 8 o'clock, late is 8.30. Up at 2, maybe 2.30. Pray, commune, hour, hour and a half. Study four or five hours to 7.30. Family worship, start the day. you got to spend one-third of your life with Jesus. Yeah. I'm telling you. Wow. This is where we are now, one-third yes. of your life. Yes. I'm at the age now, I only need five and a half, six hours sleep, and I'm, I'm good. I don't need eight, nine hours anymore. That was when I was in my 20s, right? Ten hours, 11 hours. I don't need that much sleep anymore. Hmm. So I take advantage of that. Get on your knees and talk to God. That's what he wants. We're going to talk about that this week, too. You need to commune with him. Because you have to know him. John 17, 17, verse 3. Mm -hmm. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast said. You have to know him or you're not going to heaven. A, relation, a real relationship. And he has to know you. That's what the Bible says too, right? Yeah. It's reciprocal. Got to know each other. This is not a game. We're talking about heaven. As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them, this is, this is not a very nice list here, but everybody in this room is going to go through one or two of one in particular of these, these points. Some of them will be, one, thrust into prison. Some will be, two, exiled. Some will be, three, treated as what? Slaves. Slaves. It's not, it's not going to be spiritual slavery. People are talking about that. Or it's going to be mental. Our, our brains are going to be chained up. No, no. Treated as real slaves. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible. Not so impossible now, does it? No. But as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, and they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts, there will be strange developments. Was there a strange development in Washington, D.C. today? Yes. Unprecedented. Never happened before. And I still don't understand why nobody got shot or arrested. There were no law enforcement anywhere. 
but God knows. Every individual, is that everybody in here? Yes. In our world will be arrayed under one of two banners. Watch. The two armies will stand distinct and separate, and this distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convinced of truth will come on the side of God's commanding people. Say amen. amen. When this grand work is to take place in the battle, prior to the last closing conflict, she says, now in the last quote, she says, some. This quote, in Maranatha 199, she says, many will be in prison. Many will flee for their lives from cities and towns. And many, wait, let, let me go back. I didn't get a response from that. Many will flee for their lives from cities and towns in Phoenix and Scottsdale and Tempe. Yeah. And, amen. And many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth. Some of you know my testimony. Amen. From back in the day, I have two felonies. I was a fool. A fool. So I looked at this, and I looked back in the day, and I said, well, back in my younger days, I hated being in jail, right? I didn't like it. But I think based on the faith we're going to have to have at that point in time, we're going to be happy to be there for Christ's sake. What do you say? Mm -hmm. Amen. We, we better be. We better be. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Job. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job or Job? J-O-B. Job. Job. Thank you, brother. Thank you for bringing that out. Job 1. We all know this. We're going to start at verse 6. Job 1 and verse 6. Lord, we pray for a blessing on your words as we read them again. Keep us alert and attentive, Father, is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, ask and thank you. Amen. Amen. Job 1, verse 6. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. 7. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now verse 6 tells us, and we learn from the spirit of prophecy, that these are the leaders, representatives of all of God's worlds. Satan was there because he's what? The leader representative of this world. When Adam and Eve sinned, Adam forfeited his leadership and authority over this planet. Are you with me? You all know that. Forfeited. So Satan now works through people, works through agents, human agents, to fulfill his will and his mission on this earth. For now, are you with me? Mm -hmm. She brings out the fact of story of redemption that as soon as Eve fell, she became an agent of Satan, literally on the spot, just like that. And she immediately went to her husband and seduced him into sinning. She became a cooperator with Satan, an agent, because of how many sins? One sin. George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah. All right. Hegelian dialectic. What is that? The Hegelian dialectic is where the ruling elite, is there a ruling elite in this world? Yeah. Absolutely. We're talking about entertainment. We're talking about business. We're talking about banks. We're talking about sports. We're talking about all of that. Satan is over all that, working through human agents, right? The ruling elite create what? A problem, anticipating in advance the reaction of the population to the crisis and thus conditioning the people to call for what? A change. Has that happened in 2020? Yes. When the population is properly conditioned, face masks, and the desired agenda of the ruling elite is presented as the what? Solution. There's that word again. The solution. The what? Solution they present is not intended to solve the problem, vaccine, but to serve as the basis for a new problem, new strain, or exacerbate the existing one. That's exactly what we're seeing. No question about it. 
when the newly created problem reaches boiling point today in Washington, D.C., it becomes the foundation for the people to clamor for change again. You got a whole new problem now. And there are going to be many more problems coming. We're just getting warmed up, brother, sister. Just getting warmed up. So the agenda is centralization of power. Thesis, manufactured terrorist threat, terrorist threat or problem. Antithesis is repressive police state, martial law. Synthesis, removal of freedoms. Are we seeing that? Mm -hmm. Transfer of power from the many to the few. Yeah. You cannot board a plane without a mask. It has to be on your nose the entire time. That bothered me coming here. My wife and I fly a lot, a lot. It was very interesting. Something else happened on that plane that was very interesting too. I meant to mention this to Sister Sanderson. Maybe within the last 30, 45 minutes of the flight, we're almost getting ready to descend. Pilot got on the, on the mic and he said, we have a situation here up front. Are there any medical personnel here? Anybody that's a medical doctor, nurse, practitioner, EMT? This one man got up, walked all the way up, and he was up there all the way till we landed. So somebody had a, a, a serious problem. They had medical personnel waiting when we landed. They told us at that point that they would come on with the wheelchair, take this person off, then we could all be playing. So you know what crossed my mind? What if my wife or I would have gotten up She's the lead in, in this department, by the way. She's the lead. I follow her. I mean, by well, I'm following Jesus. Why well, she's following Jesus? What if she would have gotten up, walked down the aisle, and they would have asked, "Oh, hello. What are your credentials?" And my wife said, well, "I'm a medical missionary." What, if they, what, what would they have said to that? What is, what is that? What is that? Well, I, I ascertain the cause. I correct the conditions, and I want to see if this person. Is living the eight laws of health because that a violation of one of those laws is what causes the condition, the illness. Yeah. They have taken her serious? Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but we're talking about God's plan, we're talking about solutions. Phoenix, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, all these other suburbs, they should be beating on the doors of this church because we have the answer right in here. The answer to COVID is right in here. It's called the eight laws of health. Okay. We'll, get, we'll get back to that. I just want to plant that. We'll get back to that. This is what it's all leading to right here because Satan is working through this system here. This is what Satan's trying to get to. As Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, were they related? Yeah. How were they related? Right. All right. So he will stir up the wicked to destroy God's people in what? The time of trouble. Is that the early or little time of trouble? Or is that the big or great time of trouble? Which one, church? It is, yes, it is the great time of trouble. Remember, she uses this term interchangeably. So based on the context, you have to figure out or understand which time of trouble she's talking about. So if he's trying to destroy God's people, this is definitely the time of trouble. Because Sister White actually says, the time of trouble is Jacob's time of trouble. They're the same. They run congruently or, or, con, or con, continuously, right? And as he accused Jacob, he will urge his accusations against the people of God. Same way. He numbers what? The world as his subjects, and he believes he can conquer this earth. He's not going to give up. But there's a problem for Satan. It's right here. But the little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. If he could block them from the earth, his triumph would be what? Complete. He would be the ruler of this planet. Destroy us. Nobody to represent Jesus or God. Nobody to vindicate his name or character. God has to apologize to Satan, change his name back to Lucifer, and let him back into heaven. It's not going to happen, is it? We already know the ending, brothers and sisters, and it's a good ending. I like the ending. Amen? I love the ending. Praise the Lord. So we need some clarity tonight. The need for clarity. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of what? Confusion. Say that again. Confusion. But of what? Peace. Now, this says, as in how many churches? 
all churches of the saints. All of them, no con that's, that's what the Bible says. But, brother, sister, there's some confusion taking place in our ranks today. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. What time is it is the question. Question here. What is our most important work? Answer. Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as when? Now. Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Sounds like he's talking to us right now today, doesn't it? Today. Never before were young men and women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. Is that true? All oh, these young people, they, they really have a difficult. Watch. Question. What has God ordained to help enable us to accomplish this work? Answer. Two lines. Two lines. What lines are we talking about? We're talking about regular. And what's the next one? Irregular. Irregular. That's right. Two lines in our church. In every Adventist church, there are, at least there should be, two lines. The regular line and the irregular line. Are you with me? We're going somewhere tonight. The regular and the irregular. Now we know the regular line, back in Jesus' time, was the Jewish theaters or what? The church. The church. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read verse, we're going to start at 15. Acts 1 and verse 15. How's everybody doing? Okay? Everybody wide awake? Yeah. All right. We're about an hour behind our, our designated time to go to bed, but God is faithful. Amen? Amen. We're one hour behind the, the Tennessee time zone. Acts 1 and verse 15, we all get there. Please respond by saying amen. Amen. All amen. right. Verse 15 of Acts chapter 1. The Bible says again, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about how many? An hundred and twenty. Sixteen. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them, that took Judas, right? Betrayed him with a kiss. 17. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this what? Yes. Ministry. So did Jesus have a ministry? Yes, he did have a ministry. Absolutely so. And it was a very, very successful ministry, wasn't it? So the work of Jesus, that's the ministry. That's an irregular line. So you have the church body, which is regular, and you have ministries, or self-supporting, which are irregular. But here's the key. They are not, and I'm going to say this five times, they are not, they are not, they are not, they are not, they are not to be separated. My wife and I have a ministry. Where am I teaching this week? In a church. In a synagogue. Are you with me? Did Jesus do that? Yeah. yeah. He worked with the churches, didn't he? Yeah. He was trying to share with them the entire gospel. They had a narrow, Sister White said, they had a narrow view of the Bible. Right? They were exacting. So Jesus came to show them his method, how to live and how to work. So that's what ministries do today. We show the body the entire three angels message. Because the body, in a lot of instances, in most instances, have limitations on what they can do regarding that. So this is God's plan for finishing the work. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to, I didn't mean to show you that. Let's go to Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. We're going to walk through this carefully, carefully. Well, we have to talk about some things. Sister Sanderson says she wants to get cut tonight. Amen? Amen. Matthew okay. 12. Matthew 12. Starting at verse 9. When you all get there, please let me know. Please. Amen. 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 Matthew 12 and verse 9 again. The Bible says, 
And when he, meaning Jesus, and when he, I still hear leaves, I'm going to wait, wait for my dear sister, Matthew 12, we all right? All right. Verse 9, and when he, Jesus, was departed thence, he went into their what? Synagogue. What is a synagogue? A church. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might do what? Accuse They always had a hidden motive. Always. 11. And he, Jesus, and he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? 12. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then said he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. We call that medical missionary work. That's what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 12. Next verse, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might do what? Destroy him. Destroy him. So the Jewish leaders, the church leaders, were trying to do what? Stifle. Is that clear? Yes. Jesus was trying to do the work that his father sent him to do. They were trying to destroy the work, the medical missionary work, the gospel illustrated on two legs, on two limbs. To totally stop the work, right? Let's go to John chapter 4. John 4. John chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse 31. John 4 and 31. John 4 and 31. Again, when you arrive there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. John 4 31. Again, the Bible says. Let's walk it through. I'll wait a second. I'll wait a second. John 4, 31. Here we go. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, do what? Eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Have any man brought him up to eat? Of course, Jesus was talking about what? Spiritual meat. That's right, church. 34. Jesus saith unto them, Listen, my meal is to do, my meat, sorry, is to do the will of him that sent me and to what? Finish. Finish his work. That's all Jesus wanted to do. Finish the work. And that's what we all should be wanting to do is do what? Finish the work. Finish the work. Finish the work. That was Jesus' work on earth. Now, let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Now we all know this chapter. Jesus basically, to put it nicely, slammed the Jewish leaders, right? He gave them eight woes. Pharisees, scribes, hypocrites in Matthew 23. Eight, eight woes, right? But we're going we're gonna to pick up at verse 37. This is what he said. With tears in his voice and tears in his heart. Verse 37. Read this verse with me, please. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Then he pronounces, he pronounces in verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you a desolate. So he's foretelling, he's prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, the inner probation for the Jewish people, and also the destruction of the what? The temple. The temple. The church. So in other words, Jesus was basically saying the churches will do what? Close. They will close. Hmm. Let's go to Matthew 12. Back to Matthew 12. You got to see this. Matthew 12, we're going to pick up where we left off. We left off at verse 14. 
when the leaders sought counsel against Jesus that they might do what? Destroy him or stifle the work. Let's see Jesus' response to that. Remember, all this is a representation or a type of what we're going through today, right now. Watch. Matthew 12, verse 15. After they said they were trying to destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he did what? Yeah. Healed them all. So what did Jesus do? Yeah. He said the work will advance. The churches are closed, but the work will advance. So he continued to do what? Medical missionary work. Are you with me? Yeah. Is that clear? Yes. All right. That's what I want to make sure of. We are made sad as we see in many places so much left undone that should be done. But the Lord will use in the accomplishment of his work means that we do not now see. Now I want you to go to, hold right there. Let's go to Mark 12. I want you to see something. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. This is important. Mark 12. And we're going to pick up at verse 35. Mark 12, 35. We all there, amen? amen? All right, Mark 12, 35. Mark 12 and verse 35. Here we go. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple. Where? In the, in the church. In the temple, in the synagogue, in the church. This is a reinforcement. Jesus with the ministry was working with the, the churches. Are you with me? Yes. How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. 37. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And who? The common people heard him how? Gladly. Gladly. Not trying to destroy him, but received him, hearkened, listened, heard, and heard him most of the word that was used. Gladly. Gladly. Who? The common people. Are you with me? She says, he will raise up from among the common people. Is this something new or is this, is this consistent with Jesus? It's very consistent. Watch. The common people, men and women, to do his work. To finish the work. Even as of old, he called fishermen to be his disciples. There will soon be an awakening that will surprise many. Those who do not realize the necessity of what is to be done will be passed by. I should have underlined that. What is to be done? Hmm, that's, that's big. That's a big, big clause there. And the heavenly messengers will work with those who are called the common people, fitting them to carry the truth to many places. Now is the time for us to awake and do what we can. Amen. So Jesus wanted to use the leaders in the church, but they didn't want to be you. They didn't want him. Now, am I condemning the church? No, of course not. My wife and I love our church. We're members of our church. We are active in our church. And our pastor, I praise God, understands this principle. He loves self-supporting ministries. He loves working with us and other ministries that are in our church and doing the work together that God ordained to do. Amen? Amen. No separation, no jealousy, no envy, no debating, nothing. He embraces it. And I say, praise the Lord. What do you say? Amen. He embraces it. It is time that church members understood. Is that a big word? No. no. You or me or I cannot understand anything according to the Bible, Psalm 73, 17, unless we are in the most holy place of that heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Because David said, until I entered the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Are you with me? That's where understanding comes from. First Chronicles 22, 12, the Lord says, God only giveth wisdom and understanding. And that's the only place it comes from. So if he's giving it, and he's in the most holy place now, where do we need to be by faith? In the most holy place. They should take up the work right where they are. Let me go back here. No one is to wait for a regular process before they make any efforts. They should take up the work right where they are. So we can't use the fact that the majority of churches in America today are closed. There's no excuse. Keep it moving. Keep working. 
Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you. There should be many at work in what are called irregular lines. Did she say a few? Many, many irregular. If 100 laborers would step out of the regular lines and take up self-sacrificing work, such as Brother Shireman has done, souls would be won to the Lord. This is God's principle. This is God's method of finishing the work. Self-sacrificing or self-supporting. Are you with me? And the workers would understand by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. Amen. So God loves his church, but he can't take his church, snatch it up from the foundation, and fly it over to Indonesia. He can't do that. But he can uproot members in the church and send them there. Amen? Amen. That's right. My wife and I went to Africa last year, or a, year, a little over a year ago. We came back. Our pastor was ecstatic. He just he was on fire. And I gave he wanted me to get presentations like every week. You know, I came back with 3,000 plus pictures, pictures and videos. I couldn't help it, amen? amen. <laughs> so this is God's plan. You have regular lines and irregular. This is a letter from the South Atlantic, Atlantic Conference. I got to get closer. It's a little small. I'm actually not going to read that yet. That shouldn't even be there. I want my brethren to begin to understand some things for themselves. God alone, by the quickening, vivifying influence of his Holy Spirit, can enable men to distinguish between the sacred and the common. Only God can do that, right? God alone can make men understand that working on regular lines has led to irregular practices. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you, do you believe that God is pleased that the majority of our denomination of churches are closed right now? Do you think God's pleased with that? No. Sister White said God loves this church. It's the one object that he holds in supreme regard on this earth. Supreme. It is the apple of his what? I loves this church. It's a depository of truth. It's a dispenser of truth. So the fact that these church doors are closed has to be breaking his heart. Why are they closed? Why is the church doing the same thing that the Sunday churches are doing? That's a very honest and serious question. He made, what did I say in the opening? He made provision for all of this. So some, something's missing. Something's amiss. If we have a health message, what's the concern? Let's continue. God alone can make men's minds as they should be. <clears throat> the time has come when we should hear less in favor of the regular lines. If we can get away from the regular lines into something which, though irregular, is after God's what? Order, order, it may cut away something of the irregular working which has led away from Bible principles, like, like closing the churches. You want the truth? Yes. The churches should be open. Yes. This church is open. Yes. Right. Why not? I mean, I'm just saying. This church is open. So are the irregular lines designed to split off from the regular lines? You know the answer to that already, right? Mm -hmm. Never. She said, I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. And that is the biggest challenge, brothers and sisters, for our movie today. You bring somebody in and you got half a dozen or maybe 50 different splinter groups everywhere. Offshoot over here, offshoot, upshoot, downshoot, all over the place. People don't know what, what church to go to. Well, now there's no church to go to. So what do, you, what do you do now? God has a plan. We're gonna talk about it this week. God has a plan. God has a system that he put in place for such a time as this. Listen. There is not the least consistency in this. There is not the least evidence that such a thing will be. Those who shall heed this false message and try to leaven others will be deceived and prepared to receive advanced delusions. And they will come to what? None. Come to none. 2 SM 68. What's question? What should the relationship be between the regular and irregular lines? Answer. 
combined, does that mean with? Yes. yes. Combined medical missionary work with the proclamation of the third angel's message. Hmm. Make regular organized efforts to lift the churches out of the dead level in which they have been for how long? Years. This is not Brother Bridges' opinion. This is the prophet talking about God's church. Are you with me? Amen. Send out into the churches workers who will set principles of health reform or the principles of health reform connected with, connected with the third angel's message before the church. See if the breath of life will not then come into these churches. This is the remedy to wake the church, according to the prophet, to resurrect the churches. Amen. The health message. The entering wrench, the great right arm. That's what she says is needed to get these churches back on their feet. Literally. Literally. Was that Christ's method? Yes. yes. She brings out in the ministry of healing. He did more healing than yeah. preaching and teaching. Why do you think Jesus was able to have great, the Bible says, great multitudes follow him? Because he was healing everybody. Word was everywhere. Thousands were following him around the countryside. Thousands of people. Can you picture that? Would you follow him if he made you feel better? I know there are people in here right now that are afflicted. Somebody's sick in here. I know that. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. We're in a sin-cursed world, so somebody's sick. But if somebody comes and just touches you and says, be thou, be thou whole, and tells you, don't, don't go and tell nobody. Are you going to go tell somebody anyway? That's what they did in the Bible, right? You're not going to be able to help it. Right. When you make a man or a woman or a child feel better, they want to hear anything else. Would you ask some more truth for me? Because health, brothers and sisters, is truly wealth. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right. Pretty baby, huh? Yes. All right. Let's go to Matthew 24. I want to look at something. Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. And thank you for giving me a time update, my brother. I appreciate that. I need that. I don't want to keep you guys here all night. Amen? Matthew 24. Now, we all know the context. This is a summary of the end time events that are going to take place before Jesus comes. The whole chapter. We're going to look at a few verses and get a lesson. Matthew 24. Now, we know that the disciples came to Jesus. And they showed him the buildings of the temple in verse 1. And they asked him a question. It looks like in verse 3, and we all there first of all, amen. amen. All right, in verse 3, they asked three questions, but it's actually, it's really one question. It's really technically one question. Verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him how? Privately, privately, saying, tell us, one. When shall these things be? And two, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And three, and of the end of the world. So they, they, they tie together the fact that this, this temple is going to be torn down or destroyed and not one stone will be left upon another. It has to be the end of the world. Then they say, what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're, they're also tying together, you coming has to be the end. So all three of these things have to happen when? Simultaneously. That's what they deduced. Amen? Amen? Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. That's Amen. a big one. Amen. And Jesus, he knows what he's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. One thing about Jesus, he never engaged in small talk. If you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus never wasted a word. Are you with me? He was all about finishing the work. And he's doing the same thing here. Six. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not what? Is not yet. So you're going to hear these things, wars, rumors of wars. Don't worry about it. It's not quite the end quite yet. Then he continues in verse 7. For nations shall rise against nation, continuing from the thought of wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and there shall be coronavirus, and earthquakes in diverse places. Amen. Now, that word diverse literally translates from the original Greek and means throughout, as in throughout the world. Are we seeing that today? 
I don't care if it's man-made, man-made and made in a laboratory, it doesn't matter, it's here. Yeah. And people are dying. Mm -hmm. People are dying. Made up or not, it's happening. Jesus didn't say how it was going to happen, he said it was going to happen. Are you with me? Yeah. That's what we have to consider. Mm -hmm. Then he says in verse 8, these are what? The beginnings. You mean this is the beginning? Some people say, well, Brother Bridges, this has to be the early trouble. All this going on, the trouble has started. No, no, it hasn't. Biblically, it has not. There's no trouble until there's trouble against God's people. There's no law passed yet, so there's no trouble yet. So right now is the time to what? Prepare while we can. Amen. Right now. If there was a window, there's a window, right? We've got a window right here. It doesn't open. This window was open right here. And now you, you're trying to get through the window to get in. And I started to close the window. Does your opportunity increase or decrease? decrease? Your window of opportunity is doing what? Closing. That's what's happening right now. And it's closing rapidly. I'm amazed at how quick everything is happening. It's amazing. We've been studying this for years. I'm, I'm blown away. But she said in 19, page 11, the final movements will be what? Right. Does the prophet know what she's talking about? Yes. Through the grace of Jesus. Amen? Amen? We can't argue with the prophet. So the word sorrows literally means birth pains. One, the pain of childbirth. Travail pain. Birth pains. Two, intolerable anguish. Is that what's going to happen before Jesus comes? <laughs> I'm just giving you the, the Greek lexicon, right? The, transl the transliteration, the original. Intolerable anguish in reference to the dire calamities to precede the advent of the Messiah. Then I have the next verse right here. And they shall, then shall they, excuse me, deliver you up to be what? Afflicted. Does that sound fun? No. And shall do what? Kill you. Certainly not fun. No. And ye shall be what? Hated of all nations for my name's sake. So obviously, something happens between verse 8 and verse 9. How do we go from the beginning of sorrows, of birth pains, to being killed? There has to be a law passed in there. Something happens. Satan gets his wish. National Sunday law is, is put in motion. Right? My question to you, brothers and sisters, is who is they? Who, who, who is that? Let's go to John 15. John 15. John chapter 15. We're studying. John 15. Amen. Glory to God. John 15. And verse 18. John 15, 18. Now remember, remember, Jesus says in, in, in Hebrews 4.15, he says, Paul writes, we are not in high priest which has not been touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tested like as ye are, but without what? So everything you and I are going through, everything we've ever gone through, Jesus went through it too. Amen? So he understands. The only difference is he didn't slip. And we praise God for that, right? A real Savior. Can you say amen? Verse 18, John 15. Here we go. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, amen, therefore the world hateth you. You're too peculiar. You're straight laced. You're odd. I say praise God. Amen. Praise God. 20. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If, there's that word, they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But they are not keeping his saying. That's why they're going to persecute him and kill him. Are you with me so far? All right, 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they... Know not him that sent me. That's the issue. They don't know him, so they're not living according to his will at all. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at verse 21. All these things will they do unto you. What things? Hate you, persecute you, because 
you are keeping my sayings. That's what the Bible is saying. You're being, in other words, you're being obedient. But who's the they? Go to the next chapter, John 16. A few verses down. John 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. Two, they shall put you out of the synagogue or close the churches. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Three, and these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. So are we talking about here in John 15 and John 16, are we, and, and Matthew 24, are we talking about the world? No. Are we talking about somebody who has a world-like mentality that is just like the world, that is doing everything and treating God's people just like the world would do? Is that what we're seeing here? Yeah. Let's see. As the storm approaches, I'm going to read that in a second because I want to recite it. She says, and that's Great Controversy 608. She says, as the storm approaches, what's the name of our series? Preparation for what? The approaching storm. So is the storm here yet? Not yet. So she says, as the storm approaches, meaning a time just like this right now, because we're not in, the storm is the passing of the National Sunday Law. That is the storm. So she says, as the storm approaches, a large class, is that the majority? Yeah. A large class, let me take these off, who have professed faith in the third angel's message, saying they believe in it, have faith in it, but are they really? No. Intending, but pretending. Who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition, of the world, of the world. Yeah. Members of the church are going to do this yeah. by uniting with the world. With the who? World. And partaking of its spirit. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light. Are you with that? Yeah. So they're thinking just like we read in John 15 and in John 16 and Matthew 24. They're thinking the same, Sister White says. No line of demarcation at all. Do we see that? Yes. All right. I'm going to continue right here. And when the test is brought, let me read what, what I just stated. They have come to be matters and you're the same, same light. I need, needed you to see this part. And when the test is brought, what is the test? National, right, nine Bible commentary, page, I'm sorry, seven Bible commentary, page 976. She calls the Sunday Law the great test. So my question to you, brother, sister, is this. If, if we're not passing the midterm right now, <laughs> look, this, this is the midterm. How are we going to pass the test, the great test? Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It is impossible. So she says... When the test is brought, they are prepared for the National Sunday Law? No. Or to, or, to, or to reject it? No. They are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. The majority. Men of talent and pleasing address. That tells me leaders, preachers, pastors, talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. Are you with me? They, the men of talent and pleasing address, they become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. This is a serious, serious statement. Is it going to happen? Yes, it is. I got news for you. It's happening right now. It's happening today. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of who? Satan. To misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations, to stir up the rulers against them. Our own brothers and sisters, the most bitter enemies of their former brethren, 
Weren't Jacob, Jacob and Esau brothers? Didn't we read that earlier? Yes. Wasn't Esau coming to kill Jacob? Came out of the same womb at the same time. Right? Well, one was holding on to one's here. You, you get the idea. You get the idea. They were twins. They were brethren. Grew up together. Same age, same everything. Well, one wanted to kill the other. That's a type. Talking about all the churches, Sunday churches. Local churches make changes to service as COVID-19 concern grows, concerns grow. That's what they were doing out, out there in the Babylonian Sunday, first day, keeping there are brothers too, amen? amen. There are brothers. They just don't have the light yet. Yet. Come out of her my people. Okay. They will. Jesus said, I have sheep that are not of this fold, and then must I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one what? Shepherd. John 10, 16. So the Sunday churches are making changes. Area churches are making changes to their services as news of the coronavirus spreads. We're just prepared to take it Sunday by Sunday and just see where we end up. Hayes said they've stopped serving wine during communion. <laughs> I was raised Catholic, so I, I, I get this. My wife was too and made other changes in the midst of coronavirus. I'm not, they're not talking about unfermented grape juice, they're talking about wine. Yeah. Right? And I smell that on plenty, plenty of priest's breath, breath going up, believe me. We are also not passing the offering place from hand to hand, which is what we typically do, and then we are encouraging folks at the exchange of the peace to refrain from touching one another. Just wave or nod a slight bow, right? They're making wholesale changes, right? In the interest of health. Yes. What are we doing? This is a letter. I'm going to get my spectacles. I'm going to get these. This is a letter from the Southern California Conference, the Asian Pacific Ministries Vice President. This is February. This is early last year when everybody was kind of scrambling, right? Now the Sunday churches are making their changes. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right. With the recent surge of COVID-19 coronavirus in Asia, we would like to take all precautionary measures to make sure our members and congregations are safe. Talking about Southern California. Coronavirus has infected patients worldwide, including those who are now being treated in San Diego and Orange County. As this becomes a bigger concern, there are protective and preventative measures that can be taken. Here are a few suggestions. No handshakes. On Friday evening, Sabbath mornings, or other events, when members enter the sanctuary. Deacons, elders, and welcoming teams should not shake hands as a way of greeting. To encourage the guests from Asia and those who have recently returned from Asia to voluntarily worship at home. Any members who show signs of a cold, high temp, flu, or cough are strongly encouraged to stay home. Provide adequate sterilization. Before entering the sanctuary, please sterilize the washing etc. So again, wholesale changes just like Babylon. Are you with me? Next. For millions of Americans, no church on Sunday is coronavirus's cruelest closer so far. So now you're going to the next level of the next tier up. Now we, we go from modifications to now closing now, right? Remember the Hegelian dialectic, a little at a time. Get them conditioned, get them comfortable, take it up another notch. That's what's happening, and it's going to continue to happen. So they closed down as the coronavirus pandemic took hold last week. Deborah Torres saw houses of worship being shuttered around the country and considered it extreme. Then came news Thursday that the Archdiocese or Diocese of Washington was calling for parishes to be closed, parishes to be closed as well, including the St. Mark's Parish, to which the 55-year-old freelance editor walks each day at noon. So they're shutting them down now. This is March. We got the news about our church, our local church closing down. We were stunned. But not real surprised. Not real surprise. South Atlantic Conference. So Babylon closed. What do we do? Close. We closed. We have all watched with intense interest the news reports on the progression of the coronavirus. Skip down here. The executive officers of the conference, blah, blah, blah. We have given this matter much prayer and considerable discussion. We are therefore mandating that our churches immediately discontinue in-person worship services and that they remain closed for Sabbath services until further notice. Our church has not reopened yet. 
That was March when it closed. I believe it will not ever open again. That's my opinion. Because it's not going to get better, it's going to get what? Worse. By default. That's Bible prophecy talking, not Brother Bridges. A mega church pastor in Florida told his parishioners not to take a COVID-19 vaccine and instead believe in divine immunity. Hmm, you mean you mean this brother, our brother here, our first day brother is exercising some faith? A pastor at a Florida mega church has encouraged his parishioners not to take the COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available and instead told them to believe in divine immunity. Watch this. Guillermo Maldonado, the founding pastor of Miami's King Jesus International Ministry, made the scientifically inaccurate comment during a sermon that was streamed on Facebook live on Sunday, ridiculing a faithful Christian and his belief, his belief system in a God that can cure and prevent disease. That's right. It's just getting started, though. That's right. Just getting started. Pastor John Hay, I, when I was in the world, I used to watch him. I don't know why, but I used to be interested in watching him. Because he was a lot into prophecy and the charts and all that, right? And I was totally, this. I'm talking about, this is like the 90s. Yeah. Because we got this message. I got this message from my wife, amen, in 96. But I would watch him back when I was in my 20s. I have no idea why. And I would watch uh, Mark Finley, too. Had no idea why. I just liked the way he talked and talked about the Bible. But I wasn't giving the Bible the time of day. But I praise God for his, his patience with me. Amen? Amen? So he says, we have a vaccine. The name is what? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Faith. This man is 80. I think he's 82 now. Faith. How about us? Wow. Where's our faith? Adventist Healthcare Subject Coronavirus Vaccine This week This was about a month ago A little less than a month ago The U.S. Food and Drug Administration Is expected to authorize the emergency use Of a coronavirus vaccine Manufacturing Pfizer BioNTech I'm going to skip down here Why do we start here we are well, this is that Venice Healthcare. They're located in Maryland. They're all part of that whole, that whole campus there, right? We are well positioned to administer shots quickly as we receive them. Let me skip down here. No, let me skip here first. We are confident in the science. At Venice Healthcare, physician experts are in quality and safety leaders have closely followed the vaccine development. <coughs> We support the safety of our healthcare workers. The opportunity to receive the COVID-19 vaccine is coming weeks, in coming weeks, will be one of many ways that Adventist Healthcare will continue to keep our healthcare workers safe. So I took the opportunity, took the privilege of calling them up today. Because we're getting stuff bombarded constantly, especially being in ministry, all the time. Telegram, WhatsApp, text, email, everything. So you have to kind of ignore it, first of all, because it's, it's too much. But every now and then I'll catch something, I'll catch my eye, and I'll, I'll read through it, or maybe one of my buddies in ministry will say, you need to see this. So I called them up today. And I asked her, I said, I got this letter. And she, was, she couldn't understand what I was trying to explain. She thought I had the letter in my hand. I said, no, there's people, they do group texts and group emails, and people all over the, the, the country, the world have them, within minutes. It's a very quick process. She really had no idea what I was talking about. And so she said, can you, can you tell me what names are on there? So I gave her these names. Susan Glover and Andy Catanzaro. Catanzaro. She said, oh, Dr. Andy. Yeah, I know who they are. So I said, are you familiar with this letter? I said, no, but it sounds like it's something that's probably real. She said she was going to call me back. I don't expect her to. But brother, sister, this is the point. This is the lesson. Our denomination is doing the same as the ways of the world. The, 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 the they we read in Matthew 24, the they in, in John 15, and the they in John 16. They're thinking the same way. What's going to happen when the National Sunday Law is passed? They're going to think the same. They're thinking the same way now. There's no separation anymore. Anymore. None. When I say none, I mean none. 
I'm talking about pastors up in the pulpit, dancing, <coughs> moonwalking, serving tea and coffee in the churches, danishes, cinnamon rolls. I could go on and on. God's church is being disgraced. Who is going to stand up and be a real Seventh-day Adventist? That's my question this week. Who's going to do it? God needs a group of people that are going to vindicate his name and his character and his high standard for his people. Somebody has to do it. I say it can be all of us. What do you say? Amen. 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 So they are going to take the vaccine. They're going, to, they're going to encourage leaders all over the churches to do that because they're thinking the same. The Sunday churches are being told, the pastors and leaders are being told to take the vaccine in front of their congregations. That's what they're being told to do. What about us? Our pastors and leaders are being asked to do the same thing. The same exact thing. We need you to take in front of your church the vaccine so they'll feel more comfortable with it. I'm just telling you what I know. And if you don't feel like taking it, let me help you out. Maybe this will persuade you. Let me give you a little, a little help so that you will take the vaccine in front of your church. I'm not talking about 50 or 100. I'm talking about thousands of dollars. I'm talking about half of your salary. I know what I know. Yeah, I heard it. I know we know of a pastor that said, no, I'm not going to give in. We know of a pastor that said, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm near, I'm near retirement. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the money. Can you believe this? It's, it's unbelievable. But this is what's happening right now. So our church, brothers and sisters, is in trouble. Is it even a seven-day Adventist church anymore? That's the question. Christ, although brought to great physical suffering, refused to yield a single point, notwithstanding the most flattering. What's that word? What does that mean? Money. Were presented to bribe and influence him to yield his integrity. All this honor, all these riches and glory, said the deceiver, will I give thee if thou wilt only acknowledge my claims. Jesus said, no, you can't buy me out. I'm here to finish the work that my father sent me to do. Amen. Great controversy 607. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commanded keepers. I pray it's everyone in this room and beyond. We got a work to do. They will be threatened with fines, and I'm going to ask somebody to please ask the young people, I know they're young, ask them if they can keep quiet for a few more minutes. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as what? Inducements, inducements mm -hmm. to renounce their faith. That's what's happening today, Ooh. right now. We haven't even reached this point yet. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? We're not even here yet. As the storm, what, approaches a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Wow. Doing the same thing our Babylonian brothers and sisters are doing. And I'm not saying Babylonian in a negative or condescending way. They're in Babylon right now, right? What does Babylon mean? Confusion. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. The same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Our dear brothers and sisters, we have a great work to do. We have a great work to do in these cities. God has a system in place, an evangelistic system to work these cities. Have you ever heard of it? We're going to talk about it this week. I'm not going to give it away too early. We got four more days after today, amen? But the system is perfect. All we have to do is comply. Whatever thou say, Lord, I will do. Not like the Israelites with their hands behind their back with their finger crossed like this. We don't want to do it that way. We have our hands up. Lord, whatever thou sayest, I will do. Me and my family. Can you say amen? Family. This is... Headquarters of the conference, Tacoma Park, and this is Review and Hero, 1904, approximately. This is it now. Satan's chief work is where? At the headquarters of our faith. So it's no surprise that we see what's going on, is it? None. Shouldn't be.
He spares no pains to do what? Corrupt men in responsible positions and to persuade them, persuade them any way he can to be unfaithful to their several trusts. He insinuates his suspicions and jealousies into the minds of those whose business it is to do God's work how? Faithfully. While God is testing and proving these helpers and fitting them for their posts, Satan is doing his utmost to deceive and allure them. That's a big word. Allure them. Any way he can. That they may not only be destroyed themselves, but may influence others to do wrong and to injure the great work. And the work is injured. It is injured. Regular lie. Irregular lie. Who do you think God's depending on more now? The irregular lie. Absolutely. 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 So it's time for us to step up. Jesus continued to advance the work even though he was trying to be killed. The work must go forward in faith that we lead to results to who? To God. As the storm approaches, we read that earlier. Now, what does that represent? The third angel's message. Yes. We're going to close with this. I want you to, I want you to print this, stick it in your mind, and keep it in there. This is one manuscript release. Two, we're going to talk about this all week. One manuscript release, 228, paragraph 2. Why do we have this? Here's the answer. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to do what? Prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. That's it. To prepare us to be able to stand and not fall. Not give in to Sunday. Not receive the mark. He wants us to receive the what? The seal of God in our foreheads. Amen? Amen. So again, we're not condemning our churches. I told you my wife and I love our local church. We always have. But I presented the evidence, brother, sister, by the grace of God. You see what's taking place. It's not a secret. We want to bring somebody into the faith. We're trying to win souls. And we bring them to church. We can't fly all the way to, to Phoenix. There's very few churches open in Tennessee. Very few in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And the surrounding areas. Very few. So my prayer is that we recognize we have a great work to do. And God has a way for that work to be completed or put it in a biblical way to be finished. Amen? Amen. All those who are able, can we pray? Let's talk to God and ask him to help us to finish this work. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for you being with us. We need you, Lord. We can't, we can't live without you. It's impossible. We need your breath. We need your constant influence on our lives. You tell us, Lord, in Matthew, Matthew 1, that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel. They shall call him Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So we believe you are with us tonight. We pray for your presence, Lord, for the next four days, including Sabbath. We need an outpouring of your spirit, Lord, to go through this. We're squeezing the lot in in a short time, but we know you are more than able to do it. The Bible tells us that nothing is impossible with you. Please be with our dear brothers and sisters as they depart this place. We pray for our angels to accompany each vehicle as they go their several ways. Please grant them traveling mercies on these highways, Lord. It is dangerous out there. People are texting and talking on the phone it's consistently and continually. It's a dangerous place to be on those highways. Please keep them safe. Place a mighty hedge about them and us as we make our way to our destinations. And we pray that you will bring us all back again safely tomorrow night. Lord, we love you so much. Please help us. Help us to live the entire Third Angels message, the entire Bible. Nothing missing and nothing between. In Jesus' name we love and thank you. Let all the church say, Amen. Amen. Amen.